But I'm very pleased to open this session on the latest and greatest U.S. National Climate Assessment. It was just released um, a month ago at the White House, and it was three years in the making. So I want to give you some of the highest level messages in the National Climate Assessment, uh, and then we have a distinguished panel that will follow, and that will delve more deeply into these issues. And if everything goes as planned, we'll have some 30 or 40 minutes with all of you to take your questions. First of all, why did we do a national climate assessment? Well, it's the law. Congress decided that it should be done way back in 1990, 24 years ago. It established the Global Change Research Act, which created the Global Change Research Program, 13 federal agencies, and it re in Section 106 of this law, it called for an assessment that synthesizes the science, that discusses the impacts of climate change in a number of different socioeconomic sectors, and it analyzes trends going out 25 and 100 years. And I think thinking about this happening 24 years ago is really very far-reaching. Uh, Congress, as you know, thinks in time frames of usually two to six years. And indeed, I was working for the Congress when this passed, and that was in response to only having the very first intergovernmental panel on climate change, which is the world consensus climate report produced through the UN system every few years. We now have five of those IPCC reports. This is the third national climate assessment, and the science in the 24 years that have passed have cert has certainly become very strong. So you're now seeing words in the, the scientific conclusions such as unequivocal, which you never hear scientists say, and the IPCC said that seven years ago, that warming is unequivocal. And last year, that they said that they're now 95% certain that most of the warming that's been observed in the last 50 years is due to humans, 95% certain. So it's no longer a science question of whether climate is changing, but really what it means to me in my place, what can be done to tackle greenhouse gas emissions, and very, very importantly, what can we do to cope with the changes that are already underway and more that are in store. And that's what this newest assessment focuses on. So for years, we've been collecting the dots, and now we're connecting a lot of those dots with this assessment. And we're really trying to do more than summarize the science, but really enhance, as you see here, the nation's ability to anticipate, to mitigate, and adapt to climate change and keep the lines of communication open between the public and the private sectors to make progress as rapidly as possible with the best information. Now, I know it's just after lunch, and I know it was raining today, so maybe I'll just give you the, bottom, the, the four bottom lines right up front and then come back and explain it a little more. So first, the National Climate Assessment concludes climate change is no longer a future concern. We're experiencing it now. And already with the about one degree Fahrenheit global average temperature increase, we are seeing increased incidences of especially extreme flooding, as you see in this Cedar Rapids photo from 2008, as the planet is warming and speeding up the hydrological cycle. Second message is that Americans are already feeling these effects from both extreme events and also from sea level rise. So for example, the extra one foot sea level rise that New York City has experienced this century meant that the floodwaters from Sandy reached further inland and did more damage than otherwise might have happened. Um, third, that really impacts are available in every region and in every sector, including health, agriculture, energy, water, and it's affecting us now in our pocketbooks on the land, on the water, it's affecting farmers, it's affecting mayors, it's affecting engineers, town planners, doctors, and patients. And the fourth message, there are many actions that we can take to reduce future climate change damages, but also we must prepare for the impacts that are occurring already. The world, as you know, I hope, is committed to having a climate treaty in 2015. The president has created a climate action plan and proposed mitigation actions, as well as created an adaptation task force with state, local, and tribal leaders, and you're going to hear from some of them tomorrow. And so we're trying to help local communities in their already engagement in acting to respond to the observed changes. Um, certainly more than before is happening, but still less than is needed. And these actions must be both encouraged and amplified. 
Okay, so that's the quick top line for messages. A little more about the National Climate Assessment process. It was guided by an independent federal advisory committee, and there were 60 of us that included experts from universities, federal agencies, and industry. That included Monsanto, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, and Zurich Insurance. And we, a 60-person group, reached consensus on this report and its contents. Um, but there is a huge amount of input that we receive from the public, and Emily Cloyd is going to talk about that particular process in, uh, in the next talk. And finally, we agreed that the assessment process should not start up every four years, but in fact we need to continue to interact between appearances of these huge syntheses and to continue to learn for each other. The assessment has five new topical areas, oceans, coasts, urban, rural, and land use. For the first time, we have full chapters on adaptation, mitigation, and decision support. And for the first time, it begins to explore the interlinkages across sectors. So for example, the competing demands for land and for water and for energy, you have to make sure that you have enough water for the fish, for barging goods, for irrigation, for drinking water. And so you have to think across sectors when you're thinking about climate change. And it's reached the information age. It's digital, it's interactive. Um, and of course, as usual, many, many, many layers of review and every review comment has been responded to. Um, here are the sectors that are covered, and our panelists will cover uh, water, uh, Kathy, and uh, health, Marie, in more detail in the next panel. Here are the sectoral crosscuts, and Kathy will particularly, in her remarks on water, focus on the interactions of water and energy and land use. Here are the eight regions that are covered, and in contrast to the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the whole U.S. is kind of one region. Um, Don's going to give us an overview of the impacts on the Midwest region in this session, and then the whole next panel will focus on our region. There are four response chapters, and I'll just mention some hints today of the adaptation chapter, uh, and tonight with Joyce's um, keynote, and then all day tomorrow, you're going to focus much more on this very important area. So you can find any level of information in the National Climate Assessment that you want. There's the multi-hundred page report in its full glory on the web. There's the highlights document, which is a slender 148 pages. There's a 20 page overview, and you can get two pagers on each region. So there's something for every reader. And just to give you an example, I hope you've all picked them up outside. This is an example of the spreads that you can find in the highlights document. A few photos, a few graphics, not too many words. And having written government documents and many government documents in my time, this one is really accessible and easy to use. Let me just spend a few minutes on the highest level conclusions of the report. I gave you them at the very highest level in the beginning. But first, there are 10 signs that you expect if the Earth is warming. Seven of those should be increasing, and those are shown here as white arrows. Five of those seven are temperature, so that would be sea surface temperature, deep water temperature, temperature over sea, temperature over land, air temperature. And the other two that should be increasing would be humidity and sea level rise. All of those are occurring today and increasing. And the National Climate Assessment talks about the data sets that we have to prove these trends. We expect decreases in three categories, and those are shown by the black arrows. Uh, glaciers, snow cover, and sea ice. All of those are occurring today. We are losing ice mass in Greenland and the floating ice in the Arctic far faster than was expected. And this is an example of a, a nonlinear trend um, that could lead to a tipping point. So we used to talk about an ice-free summer Arctic at the end of the century. We're now talking about that being possible in a few decades. And you've probably seen that vessels have gone through both the Northeast and the Northwest Passage in recent years, uh, ironically, usually carrying fossil fuels. But an ice-free Arctic in the summer is on the way. Um, one example of the importance of a focused regional perspective is that some parts of the U.S. are getting wetter, and here that's the darkest greens, and those are mostly areas that are already wet, and some areas are getting drier, and those are the browns, and those are areas that are already pretty dry, like parts of the southwest. So this chart is showing you total precipitation change over the last century. 
But another major observed change is not just total precipitation, but how that rain is being delivered. And it's increasingly in heavy downpour. So this is clearly an area where our recent observations have borne out previous projections, because our scientific understanding told us that a warmer atmosphere would hold more moisture, and we've measured that, and it's happening. So here you see how intense precipitation has changed for the US as a whole in the last several decades. And you can see since the 1950s, that increases about 40%. Now here's a summary of how those extreme rainfall events have increased by region over the last century. And some regions like our own Midwest and the Northeast have seen very large increases in the amount of rain that is now being delivered in these heaviest events. And in fact, in the future, even in areas where we project decreases in total amounts of rainfall, when those areas get rain, we expect to see a significant proportion of that rain coming in very heavy events. So we're looking at erosive rainfall events not conducive to crops and making protecting people from floods more difficult. Um, related to this is that we've seen that the areas that have had a big increase in precipitation have also had an increase in flooding. And so this map again shows you increased precipitation in green, the green arrows and decrease in brown arrows, there's clearly a connection between the rainfall and the flood trends and the largest green arrows, mostly west of us, are showing an increase of up to 18% flood magnitude per decade, quite colossal. Of course, global warming also means that our nation has gotten hotter on average with some areas seeing bigger changes than others. And this shows that uh, most of the US has warmed about a degree and a half Fahrenheit over the last century, and, and that's about what Michigan is showing here, a little bit more than that. But going forward, if I showed you by 2100, Michigan could be eight to 10 degrees Fahrenheit warmer on average by the end of the century, and that would mean certainly a month of temperatures over 95 degrees, and climates that would feel much more like Arkansas than like the Michigan we know. And we also have seen uh, the number of frost-free days have been increasing. So in the last century, we have nine more days without frost. It may not have felt like it this past winter, but this is the century-long trend. So past is no longer prologue, and we can't plan for and manage our risks, our, manage our cities, forests, water supplies, infrastructure, and ecosystem without considering these climate risks because the climate of the last century will not persist. It's already changed and it will change more. We need to be proactive in protecting people and infrastructure and natural resources. There's a lot that can happen to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and to slow the rates of change. Um, we can use renewable energy and use energy more efficiently. There's a lot to be gained in both of those venues. And the main topic of the next two days, adaptation, here you see some of the options. Uh, you see deeper culverts to handle the increase in these rainfall events. You see houses on stilts to try to withstand the rising seas and green roofs to cool cities and capture water. But adaptation is still really a nascent, both art and science. Um, and if you look at the compendium of actions that we have in the adaptation chapter, you will see there's a flurry of characterizing things that are in this red oval, um, characterizing what's at risk and um, planning, but not a whole lot happening in the other parts of the circle. The implementation barely happening, not a lot yet of monitoring what's being tried and evaluating that, and then revising plans going forward. So we really need to get on with sharing lessons learned and communities then can respond to this changing climate more efficiently and effectively. So we need to do more in the three circles that are not filled in yet. But the good news is that we are seeing that there are many co-benefits with many of the adaptation efforts, such as cool roofs to reduce the urban heat island effect in New York City and Chicago, increasing pipe diameters to deal with runoff, planting trees to reduce stormwater um, runoff in Dayton, we're replacing our own ash trees in downtown Ann Arbor with varieties that we think will withstand the changing climate. And you're gonna hear a lot more about activities in the adaptation world tomorrow, but let me just give you three teasers so that you'll be sure and come back for more. 
So in, two, and I want to thank Missy for giving me these. In 2006, Ann Arbor encouraged more impervious surfaces to manage stormwater by updating their rate structure for stormwater utility. Uh, Grand Rapids, and you'll hear more about this tomorrow, has a sustainability plan that incorporates adaptation into it. And it also has now a new innovative market that's featuring adaptation options, kind of a living learning center about local food. Um, Flint's new master plan incorporates designs to protect Flint River and manage um, flooding from stormwater. So a lot more is happening than, did, than was happening even five years ago when we did the last assessment. So as I say, it's more than before, but less than is needed. It's not too late to change our emissions paths and future climate change and its impacts because the choices that we make or we don't make today will shape the future climate for our children and our grandchildren. So the future is really in our hands, but the actions must be taken by all. The National Climate Assessment identifies ways that communities are making progress. The federal government is committed to making data and tools available to assist us in thinking about it. So please help us continue the learning process. We really have got not a moment to lose. So thank you very much for your time. And now we'll move on to the panelists. We'll just skip this for now. And uh, there we are. Uh, so you saw earlier the vision, and you'll see that the vision.